Yeah. So, so it was an article written by Hillary Clinton in Foreign Policy uh, magazine that launched uh, the pivot. And this is what she wrote. Uh, As the war in Iraq winds down and America begins to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan uh, and, and Iraq, uh, the United States stands at a pivot point. One of the most important tasks over the next decade will be to lock in substantially increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic, and otherwise, in Asia Pacific. This is the, the South China Sea. Uh, it is now, if you will, the geostrategic center of the struggle for world power. Um, beneath it lies tremendous amounts of oil, natural gas, uh, and minerals. Uh, and over it um, moves about 40% of the world's trade. Uh, uh, most of the oil uh, that, that China and East Asian economies need uh, to, to, to function. Uh, the United States has long controlled it, uh, but China has uh, reasserted what it claims uh, historic control or historic uh, rights to this land. Um, that's basically the area that, that, that China feels the, the inner island chain that they need to control for their own security. I mean, remember that China was colonized, uh, defeated for more than 150 years. Uh, central to Chinese identity at this point is overcoming those humiliations, right? And reassuring its, um, its security. And so as they're building their militaries, uh, they're not only making claims to this, these, these waters, which sometimes conflict with, uh, with a number of countries, um, you know, but they're functionally challenging uh, what has been US uh, control and dominance of this area. Senkaku Dayo Islands, you'll see how close they are to, to China, and actually at a distance from Japan, but close to Okinawa. They're strategically located in relationship to bottling up forces uh, near Japan uh, in order to um, uh, uh, prevent any kind of response to the Chinese go into Taiwan. Uh, you have a situation there, you know, you have a situation there, uh, it's the Japanese government precipitated a crisis there about two years ago, uh, and the Chinese responded saying, you know, if you're gonna change the status quo here, we'll up the ante, we'll, we'll see you and raise you about 15. Uh, so you have a situation in which you have uh, both uh, Japanese and Chinese warships in extremely close proximity. Take a look. Tell me which, is, which ship is which. And also their aircraft flying over the area. Uh, the possibility of, a, of an incident happening is huge, right? Uh, and the perception is that given the forces of nationalism in, in each country, uh, that if there is a significant military incident there, we cannot be, oops, we cannot be assured uh, that there'll be uh, escalation uh, control. Uh, that, you know, this is, and the United States consistently says, you know, if, there, if it does come to war, we have to go to war on Japan's side because we're treaty bound uh, to do that. Uh, Joseph Nye uh, teaches at Harvard. Uh, he's one of these people going through the revolving door of Harvard and the Pentagon. He was number three in the Pentagon under Clinton. On the one hand, he says that uh, twice in the 20th century, uh, the dominant powers, which is to say the United States and Britain, failed to uh, integrate rising powers, which is to say uh, Japan and Germany, uh, into the dominant power system, resulting in two catastrophic world wars. And he says, look, we have to be aware of this history, and we have to make sure we don't repeat it, meaning the challenge of integrating China uh, into, into the U.S. system. But he also wrote just before Hillary Clinton launched the, uh, the pivot for the Obama administration. He wrote, Asia will return to its historic status with more than half of the world's population and half of the world's economic output. America must be present there. Markets and economic power rest on political frameworks and American military power provides that framework. This is from an article by Michael Clare in, uh, in, in The Nation. Uh, Obama is sending a clear message to Beijing we are becoming less dependent on imported oil, so we enjoy a stronger hand in international relations. You are becoming more reliant on imports, being China, and are in the unfortunate position of having to, to be rely on supply routes that are controlled by the U.S. Navy. With the pivot, the United States is moving to have 60% of the Navy and 60% of the Air Force in Asia Pacific. The strategic doctrine of the United States and this strategic doctrine uh, says that basically we have two uh, geostrategic pri uh, priorities. Uh, one is the Persian Gulf and the other is Asia Pacific and the U.S. military is being uh, restructured in order to maintain our dominance in each of these areas. 
uh, the, the military preparations are also what's driving uh, military spending. Um, the F-35 new fighter bomber uh, ultimately is to, expected to cost $1.5 trillion to build and to operate. Uh, we have a new military doctrine, uh, air-sea battle, uh, which is basically the, the, the idea of destroying China from the sea, from the air, from space, without putting troops on the ground, uh, making it acceptable to the U.S. people. Some of you may be aware of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, basically the secret negotiation of a massive uh, free trade area, uh, the United States, Japan, possibly uh, Korea, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, some of the South American countries on the coast. Uh, and this is, this is more than just economics. And economics, economically, it'll make NAFTA look like nothing. Uh, but it's also designed to uh, more deeply integrate the economies and societies of these countries into the United States for the longer term to turn them away from, from China. The United States is also simultaneously engaged in, in free trade agreement negotiations with the European Union. And the idea is for the United States to put itself at the head of the two largest trade areas in the world, uh, somewhat integrate them, and again use this as a leverage against, uh, against China. Because tensions on the Korean Peninsula is what provides justification for continued U.S. military presence there, and the U.S. military presence there is what guarantees U.S. economic interests in the region. So the maintaining the division of Korea is actually critical to U.S. interests in the region. So to, what the U.S. has chosen to do is carry out its pivot strategy um, instead of uh, normalizing relations uh, with North Korea. Uh, it will uh, lean on uh, its traditional allies in the region, Japan and South Korea, uh, to carry out its pivot strategy to, gain, to guarantee its hegemonic uh, position in the region. Um, so for the pivot strategy, what is necessary is a strong alliance with Japan and South Korea, specifically for the Northeast Asia region. However, the South Korean people have nothing to gain and everything to lose from the U.S. pivot. Because first of all, the U.S. pivot burdens South Korean citizens. With a deepening, deepening financial crisis and sequestration that is imposing limits on Pentagon spending here, the United States finds itself, it is unable to move full speed ahead in its rebalancing strategy in the Asia-Pacific region. So what it is doing now, it is, it is squeezing its allies in the region to pay more to host U.S. troops in their countries. So in the case of South Korea, the status of forces agreement between the US and South Korea says South Korea has to uh, contribute to the cost of maintaining US troops there. And they negotiate from time to time how much South Korea should pay to host US troops. So they just finished new negotiations in January. And according to this agreement, South Korea will pay $850 million this year, which is an increase of 6% from last year. But the most egregious discovery during the negotiations was that U.S. forces in Korea are hoarding close to $1.5 billion of South Korean taxpayer money. And that's because uh, South Korea has been uh, contributing uh, money to host U.S. forces, but that money is specifically earmarked for military construction, any construction that takes place on their bases. However, the United States has been misappropriating this money and diverting it to pay for something else, uh, for base reloc relocation, moving its bases around on the Korean Peninsula, expanding some bases. Um, and because the base realignment relocation project has been delayed many times, that money has just been sitting there uh, in a South Korean bank account accruing interest so the South Korean public, which is now weighed down by stagnant wages and growing youth unemployment, has the added burden of hosting U.S. troops, which is increasingly becoming more burdensome because chronic economic depression in the United States has forced the Pentagon to tighten its own purse strings. So, so they're now uh, burdening more its allies in the region. The U.S. pivot also destroys life. 
Many of you will recognize this picture because you know the story of Kangjung Village in Jeju Island. Many of you I, I, in Maine, I believe, have stood in solidarity with the Kangjung villagers in their seven-year fight against the construction of a naval base there. The naval base would house U.S. Aegis destroyers that are made right here in Bath, Maine. And uh, they will be used as a part of a U.S. missile def defense system that encircles China. The base construction has already destroyed the, the villagers' livelihoods and the fabric of their once peaceful community and way of life. Uh, it has also destroyed a diverse marine biology and ecosystem. And the Kurambi rocks, which is what you're seeing in the picture there, which is an ancient volcanic rock formation by the sea, home to many endangered species and a place for community gathering that has almost a spiritual meaning for the people uh, in Kangjung village. Since construction of the naval base began, uh, now a metal wall divides the villagers from the Kurambi rocks and the sea, uh, and the government has begun blasting away these rocks to make way for the base. So as you can see, the South Korean people have nothing to gain and everything to lose from the US pivot. The US pivot also ignores history. The United States wants South Korea and Japan to revitalize talks this year on a military intelligence sharing pact. The United States desperately wants its allies, Japan and South Korea, to get along. And in fact, forging a strong uh, US-Japan-South Korea trilateral alliance is very important for the U.S. pivot strategy to succeed in the region. However, the United States ignores the region's historical past, which continues, obviously, to shape geopolitical relations in the present. South Koreans may be wary of North Korea and, and also China's rising power. However, because of its historical past of being, having been colonized by Japan, it has more to fear in an offensively tra transformed, militarized, militarized Japan. There was a recent survey of South Koreans by the Asan Institute that's in South Korea. And according to the survey, most South Koreans view Japan, not China or North Korea, as the number one threat to South Korea. Here is a map just for putting the context. Um, uh, um, you see India in the in uh, in purple in the middle on the on your um, left uh, of course you know right is China and then uh, can't see very well but what I want to point out here are some of the major tensions between India and China in 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 1960s China and India fought a war and that was over the border of China and India in the Himalayas a very uh, remote areas, really nobody lives there, and there was this fight uh, with China, which was also a turning point in India's own thinking about uh, the third world and socialist countries and so forth. But if you look down in the Indian Ocean, on your, on your right you'll see uh, the Indonesian uh, um, uh, islands, Malaysia, and there is a real choke point between Indonesia and Malaysia which is the Strait of Malabar. And that's where all of the oil from Saudi Arabia to uh, all the Middle Eastern oil producing countries have to move to China through. So that's a serious problem area. And in the calculation in controlling China, in terms of depriving it of its energy demands uh, in oil and gas, what the US wants to do is to control Malabar Straits. It wants to control Indian Ocean. So there we go, there we need a junior partner, which is India, and it is building up its navy to do that. So that's the, cru the crux of the issue, and India is also building up missiles and so forth. So just, just to keep in mind the, where the conflicts are between um, uh, China and India. So I'll just talk about that, go to a picture first. And so this is what India was, during the Cold War, right after the independence. It's a picture. On the left is uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru, uh, India's first prime minister, 
He was uh, from 1947 to 1964, and the, and the person in the uh, black coat is, at that time, a very famous face, uh, Prime Minister John Lai, and uh, on his left is first President of India, and on his right is the Vice President. These were the years when India was leading. India was leading the Third World, the newly uh, independent states, a, a, a period of intense decolonization in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and India was a leader in the UN in this struggle for the Third World. So, Zhou Enlai, uh, Prime Minister Nehru, and Nasser, Tito, and Sukarno of Indonesia were the major leaders of this movement worldwide, and they, their uh, philosophy was based on this conference that happened in 1954 in Bandung, uh, where they adopted these principles of punch shield, which is primarily um, a pre, um, a peaceful coexistence amongst neighbors and countries and respect for sovereignty. And it was especially important because you have socialist countries and um, capitalist countries that have to coexist in this uh, new world order. Primarily, the small countries had to be protected and the uh, uh, principles of peaceful coexistence, non-interference, respect of sovereignty, are the key principles of Panchil. And it still drives partly India's foreign policy, but it is, it is quickly eroding. Um, and uh, uh, so the, these principles were then incorporated in the establishment of the non-aligned movement, which was uh, Founded, founding members were Tito, Nehru, Nasser, and, uh, and the NAM still exists. It's no longer a powerful force in the world affairs. It is currently chaired, uh, I don't know how many of you know, uh, it's chaired by Iran. So it does have a role to play, especially on the affairs of nuclear weapons, because every time we have a review meeting at the United Nations on the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is still the landmark treaty that uh, controls the proliferation of nuclear weapon and disarmament, supposedly. It doesn't do very well on disarmament. But these group of nations, 120 plus members, they do have a voice in the United Nations on what we do with the non-proliferation. So those were the years of decolonization, of this friendship with the newly emerging states, and India was the leader. And it caused a lot of friction with the United States at the UN. And so now we've come from that to this. So this is President Bush, surrounded by Indians after the signing of the uh, nuclear treaty, which, which allowed India now to come out of this pariah status of having developed nuclear weapons surreptitiously because it didn't have the, it didn't sign a, this treaty that I just mentioned, which is the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968. India, Pakistan, Israel are the three countries which didn't sign the treaty and, and still haven't. And uh, so Bush kind of lifted India out of this uh, problematic state when United States sanctions had to be applied to India. So this was a huge celebration in the Indian American community uh, in Washington. And now I'm not saying that the America, the US is doing a new colonialism, but certainly in its world plan, India is viewed as a very important country. And, and the primary driver of this strategy, and, and Pivot is playing into it, is military to military relationship. And that's because a, a big driver is really the military industrial complex. So we are here today, very close to Bath, Maine, and we saw uh, the christening of the uh, Zumwalt, um, and the enormous amount of money that we're spending. And yes, there are jobs, and uh, the people who are affected by it, families, little children, and people having to pay mortgage and so forth. Yes, these are important things. But we can also have jobs if we go away from a war economy to a peace economy. So it's, yes, I mean, we can build more DDG 1000s, or we can create solar parks with the most advanced technology that we can have, the high-speed rail and all this sort of stuff. So I'm an engineer. I, I, I didn't have, uh, I should have introduced myself a little better, but I've spent 20 years working in defense industry building high-power lasers for shooting down missiles. 
before I left engineering, went to Congress, and, uh, and started working on uh, policies of, of disarmament and so forth. But anyway, so I can speak with a little bit of my own experience in the military industry that engineers would love to work on things that do things for people rather than building things like the Sea Wolf submarine or, or the destroyer. It's, it's just because, thank you very much, but you need interesting problems to work on. That's what engineers and scientists are trained on. And you can give them interesting problems, whether it's a high-speed rail or a Manhattan project to build an atomic bomb. And you take your pick. You can do that. 